charts as they possibly can and film them as never seen before. Mark and Rob's persistent enthusiasm lead them to find the greatest sharks on Earth. This is their shark quest. The waters off the southern coast of Australia and a shadow materializes into an awesome predator ready to catch the unwary. In a sea as vast as the southern ocean the gentle sound of a petrel feeding on the surface could go unnoticed but its rhythmic paddling acts as a beacon underwater. The vibrations send out signals clear only to those equipped with gear fine-tuned to detect these waves. Invariably the one with the best means is a predator, and in this case, one of the most powerful of marine hunters, the great white shark. Grows over six meters long and reaches more than three tons. A streamlined body for speed and stealth. Notoriously feared as a man killer. Systematically, the Great White tests the source of the signal. Surprisingly, the petrol doesn't move much. Bird brain against shark cunning, the petrel didn't stand a chance. Could a man out of a cage? A question in the back of the mind of each diver who dares to even get into a cage and face a five meter, one and a half ton great white. Experienced Australian freedivers, Mark and Rob, have often wondered. Go up there. I should have seen that Bloody awesome. Got some footage. The two formed this diving partnership several years before this Great White encounter. They met in 1998 on a recreational spearfishing trip. Rob, diving charter guide and five times Australian spearfishing champion, has always been an underwater enthusiast and a keen adventurer at heart. While pursuing his favourite sport, he had many remarkable encounters with sharks. I developed a great respect for sharks. I wanted to see them in a more natural state. This inspired him to swap his spear gun for an underwater video camera, changing his favorite pastime from sportsman to cameraman. But now he needed a reliable diving partner who would dare get as close as possible to the sharks. Mark, builder by profession and fellow shark enthusiast, took the bait. Mark and I teamed up as dive partners because we both shared a passion for adventure and a love of sharks. My first interest in filming came after seeing sharks while we were spearfishing, trying to take our fish. Generally not showing interest in us, I wanted to bring these experiences home because telling a story, most people wouldn't believe you if you encountered large sharks and you're still here to tell the story. Now, during all their spare time, the two new friends travel around Australia in search of the most remarkable sharks to film them in their natural environment. Through our images, we try to tell a story that these sharks aren't the malign man-eaters that everyone thinks they are, but they are basically a large predator trying to survive in the ocean. Their quest leads them first to southern Australia to film the most feared of all sharks, the Great White to come face to face with the world's most feared animal. What an experience. I mean, indescribable. They're just magnificent. They're the ultimate predator, but they have a unique calmness about them. Diving with the great white sharks from a cage was an awesome experience, coming face to face with them, but we did find it very restricting. I really wanted to get out of the cage and into the open water with them. The small cages restrict filming opportunities. On the contrary, free diving would mean being able to follow the shark without any limitations and film close-up footage. But Australia's restrictive laws ban any diving with great whites out of a cage. So Mark and Rob fly to another continent where rules are a little more lenient. On the southern tip of Africa, 
A few hundred kilometers east of Cape Town, Khansbai is the closest port to the marine park of Dyer Island, world renowned for its healthy population of great whites. Mark and Rob chose to dive with Andre Hartmann, a man known worldwide for his great white dives out of a cage. Within an hour, the guys reached the seal colony off Dyer Island, main attraction for the great whites of the area and their prime source of food. The South Africans throw a large bait into the water, a much debated practice, but nevertheless one used by all operators here to entice the sharks away from their usual prey of seals and closer to the boat. And a smelly bag of fish oil and crushed sardines known as chum greases an irresistible pathway through the current. Everything's perfect. The guys are ready for action. All they need now is a shark. And they're not disappointed. Two great whites follow the chum slick to the bait. Cautiously, one approaches the boat and gapes at the men. The great white is the only fish known to do this. Various sharks move closer to investigate the bait. These sharks, they seem a fair bit more relaxed than the ones over in Oz, eh? A little more slow moving, a little more, not as deliberate, aren't they? The only problem is we've got uh, up to five or six sharks here that we've seen already this yeah. morning, so just have to keep our eyes out. We just hang by the cage to start with and uh, maybe wander out after that. The two Australians are about to venture into something more risky than they've ever done before. They are psyched and ready for their first dive out of a cage with the most dangerous of sharks. Andre, the veteran in diving with these sharks, leads the way. Mark follows. And Rob brings up the rear. First time, open water with a white shark. Should be great fun. He slips into the water without hesitation. But Mark's and Rob's nervousness shows. They stay close to the cage, making sure their backs are covered. It doesn't take long for the guys to lose their apprehension at the sight of the wonderful creature. Rob just wants to film it. This one is a four meter long, half ton mass of powerful muscles, fine tuned for stealth, strength and speed. A perfect killing machine that can snap a 200 kilogram bull seal in half. Although the shark seems at ease with the divers, they must still be cautious. Here he comes, Rob. In these murky waters, a diver's silhouette could easily be mistaken for a seal. The first dive with the Great Whites without the protection of a cage. What a mesmerising experience. I must admit I expected the sharks to be more menacing, but in fact they were quite calming. But you've got to keep in the back of your mind that things can change an instant with these animals. One flick of the tail and it could be all over. Mark and Rob make it look very easy. They convey confidence underwater. Could the sharks feel this as well? The reasons for the shark's relaxed manner are probably many. But the fact remains that free diving with great whites is a potentially dangerous pastime. Especially when a shark tries to taste and feel the moving object. Sharks do this when they come across an unfamiliar object. Lacking arms and hands with which to grip and touch, the shark uses its mouth instead. Mark and Rob know the risks involved in free diving with these menacing creatures, but their enthusiasm for filming and admiration for sharks overshadow any trepidation they may have felt before the dive. Oh, it's a big shark. Yeah. They look bigger from underwater. They look bigger when you're outside a cage. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> 
Sensational. Face to face with the four metre great white. One of the highlights of my life. Absolutely amazing. Ah, unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite dirty water, but you just come right in, sit there. What do you reckon, mate? That wasn't much different than any of those other big sharks that swam with me. They got, they got a very much a presence, though. <laughs> yeah. Very confident animal. Thousands of kilometres from home, Mark and Rob fulfil a lifelong dream to meet the most awesome predator of the oceans face to face. But their adventure is only beginning. Now they set out on an extraordinary mission to film and get as close as possible to as many of the dangerous sharks as they can find. Back in Australia, the two guys continue their search in Rob's backyard, Melbourne. Rob grew up diving and spearing on the cold water reefs off this coast. He knows the creatures that visit and inhabit these reefs. Autumn is an exciting part of the year. It adds a few more species of sharks to the local population, many of them attracted into the shallows to breed. Mark and Rob hope to encounter some of these sharks, especially the rare ones, that come up from the deep at this time of the year. The reefs here vary in depth between 5 and 15 meters, and the two men easily reach the bottom by freediving without using scuba gear. Free diving is a lot more challenging, but it lets you get a lot closer because you're not making any noise and the animals seem a lot more at ease with you. Both Mark and Rob make holding their breath while diving seem quite easy. But it takes stamina and dedication to be able to dive over and over again for several consecutive hours, each time staying at the bottom to film for a few minutes. I can hold my breath for up to three minutes while free diving, but most of my dives are one and a half to two minutes. With patience and perseverance, the two men eventually find the sharks that inhabit these cold waters. The Port Jackson is a creature of habit, which returns to the same area each breeding season. This harmless shark seldom grows to more than a meter. It possesses the remarkable ability to feed and breathe at the same time by pumping water in through the first gill slit and out through the other four, leaving the mouth free to grab and chew on sea urchins and crustaceans. Not all the footage of peculiar looking animals is of sharks. During their search, Mark and Rob find unique little things as well, such as this weedy sea dragon, a protected species which lives nowhere else in the world. Although here, in southern and western Australia, it is a common inhabitant of the reefs and seagrass meadows. Hiding in the same seagrass, the guys spot an elephant fish, a species which lives at depths greater than 200 meters for most of the year, but swims up to the shallows to lay eggs. We're very lucky to see these fish. What I find fascinating is they hardly resemble either shark or fish. This species is more closely related to sharks than it seems. It is a chimera, a fish with a cartilaginous skeleton. But that's where the similarity with sharks ends. It has a jaw more like that of a bony fish than a shark, and a naked skin, a smooth hide with no fish scales or shark denticles. Its most distinctive feature is, of course, its sensitive nose covered in sensory pores used to detect the movement and slight electrical currents of live prey like fish and invertebrates. Then, Mark notices something bigger looming over the underwater meadow. The large shape turns out to be a broad-nosed seven-gill shark. Reaches a length of three meters. Belongs to the most primitive group of sharks a dangerous pack hunter. Mark and Rob are surprised to see the shark so close to shore as it prefers to live in deeper waters. The shark ignores the divers. It seems focused almost on a mission, searching. They swim as fast as they can to keep up. The reason for the shark's presence in unfamiliar territory becomes obvious. Together with another two of its kind, it has come here to feed. 
Like all sharks, these are able to detect the smell of a dead animal hundreds of meters away. Their powerful sense of smell ensures that no easy feeding opportunity goes to waste. They are pack hunters and feed indiscriminately. They would happily eat live prey as much as decomposing carrion. A seven gill shark on its own is okay, but when they're in numbers, you do have to be careful. Mark and Rob are ecstatic. This is an exceptional filming opportunity. For the moment, the sharks seem to ignore the divers, but they are in a feeding frenzy, and they could easily turn on the two spectators. Sharks can become dangerous when they're so excited by food. They become violent gluttons biting into anything in front of them, as well as anyone close by, like watching divers. The challenge of filming these sharks and diving with them is getting close enough to make it a good shot, but being safe enough. With time, you do get to understand the shark's behaviour, but there's certain risks, and it's only a split second difference between a safe shot or a safe dive and a dangerous one. And at times, we have had to get out of the water. Excited by the feed, and perhaps attracted by the diver's movements, the sharks follow the men to the surface. Once a shark homes in on an object, its curiosity makes it move closer to find out more. The situation becomes extremely dangerous, and Mark and Rob have to leave the water. But their excitement doesn't wane as they discuss their experience. That was sensational. See the seven gillers come right up, right up to us. That one rammed straight into your shoulder. What a wait, and there's enough one there. They're ganging up on us. Gotta be careful. Beautiful shark, absolutely beautiful. Mark and Rob may be amateur cameramen, but they are skilled divers and they understand when the situation calls for their respectful retreat. But not before capturing rare footage of sharks hardly ever seen by man and an unforgettable experience. Shark Quest is not over. There are several more remarkable sharks worthy of the men's attention. Mark and Rob's search continues. Their passion and determination leads them beyond the barrier reef and into the Coral Sea, a 100,000 square kilometer region of crystal clear water dotted with isolated reefs. This is the haunt of some of the most notoriously menacing sharks on Earth, but their territories stretch over an immense expanse. Although some people fear that chumming may increase the sharks' intentions to attack, Mark and Rob decide to employ the same technique that Andre used in South Africa. Firstly, because the Coral Sea is such a vast expanse of water, and secondly, because the Leo worked so well with the Great Whites. It's the waiting game now. You can see the slick working beautifully over this reef system, then into the open deep water, and that's where some of the larger predators might be. We know they're here, it is just a waiting game. The first to see the floating chum slick are a few airborne scavengers. Then, suddenly, a large shark sneaks up to the boat. Mark and Rob identify it immediately. A tiger. The second most feared shark on Earth. Reaches a length of almost six meters. Eats anything it can find, even humans. Here she comes again. Another pass. What, a third pass? Yeah. How are you had, feeling, Mark? Yeah, we've had in these sort of situations before on the surface, Rob. As long as we maintain uh, together, don't let her try and bust us up. Yep. And um, keep facing you. Yeah, that's right. Just stand your ground. And like I said, we can always jump back out if, if it's not right. But well, we can't be overly selective. We've got a good shark here in crystal clear waters. No, let's go. Let's, let's go. go. Mark. Once more, Mark and Rob find themselves face to face with one of the ocean's most dangerous hunters. Confident 
stately and relaxed in appearance, she circles the two men, just like the great whites in South Africa. She moves closer, probably out of curiosity. Then, they notice that her mood seems to change. The circles she makes around the two divers get progressively smaller and smaller. She quickens her pace, perhaps because she's excited by the flavors emanating from the chum bucket. She eventually strikes, with a bump so hard that it dislodges part of the camera. What amazed me about this shark was its persistence. It just wouldn't leave us alone. Eventually, we had to get out of the water. My experience has been that tiger sharks are usually quite shy, but in this case, I think that the chum made her aggressive. She made several lunges at my camera, and I felt that if I hadn't kept eye contact with her and retreated, I may have become her dinner. We were trying to be evasive of her, um, especially after a couple of snaps. And the one where I seen the whites of her eye, At that stage, I thought to myself, it's time to get out. It's got to be. It was a good call to get out of the water. Oh, that's right. We can always uh, evaluate it from here and just uh, keep an eye on it. If, if the shark hangs around, we may give it a go later on, eh? Yeah, regroup and um, another plan of attack. The tiger shark probably became agitated and excited by the smells emanating from the crushed fish and oil in the chum bucket. To calm her down, Mark and Rob take the bucket out of the water. Eventually, she slows to a steady patrol and leaves the surface. But she doesn't go far from the boat. She sinks 20 meters below to the coral sea floor where the two men can still reach her. She seems more relaxed and allows the divers to film her without harassing them. Silently, they follow her meanderings over the reef bed, filming her perfect predator's body camouflaged in this environment by her tiger-like stripes. It is believed that these markings differ considerably between individuals, so much so that scientists have been able to distinguish one tiger shark from another. By now, even though the bucket has been removed from the water, the chum slick it caused spread far over the reef and attracted a few smaller species of shark, grey reefs. Suddenly, Mark and Rob hear a surprisingly loud crunching noise. The tiger shark had bitten into one of the smaller sharks. The two men have never witnessed something like this before, and certainly they have never heard of anyone filming it. It is extremely rare to actually see predation in the ocean involving the larger species. Sharks feeding on small fish is one thing, but a tiger eating another shark is an extraordinary sight. Tigers are equipped with a varied set of teeth ideal for catching and eating a large diversity of prey. Their exceptional tooth configuration acts like a saw, tearing through the prey's body when the shark violently shakes its head. It only takes a few minutes for the whole one and a half meter grey reef shark to be consumed, proving the tiger's voracious nature. So close to a feeding, dangerous shark. This is better than Mark or Rob ever expected to film. That was well worth getting back in the water. And I certainly was. I've never seen a like something before. I could actually hear a soaring sort of motion. I'm looking around, not really thinking that was the, the tiger hooking into something that big. You just couldn't script something like that. That's just an amazing experience. That was up there with the best of them. Oh, certainly, mate. Right? Face to face with a three meter tiger shark on the hunt, and once again, Mark and Rob emerged from the experience unharmed and with several tapes of unbelievable footage. But the two men do not want to give up their quest yet. 
Already, they prepare for their next dive. By evening, they're geared up to see what species of sharks prowl the reefs at night. This time, to be able to stay underwater for a longer period, the men decide to use scuba gear. Some sharks are more active during the dark hours. Mark and Rob hope to catch a glimpse of something special. The reef comes alive under the spot of their filming lights. Systematically, the two divers move between coral gullies and search the caves and overhangs. At first, all they find are the reef dwellers. A moray stays snug in its hole, waiting for an opportunity to strike out at passing prey. Rob finds a venomous sea snake. He doesn't film the reptile for long because he doesn't want to provoke the snake into biting him as its venom is so potent it could kill him. The sharks are few. The first they see is a primarily nocturnal species, a three-meter tawny nurse shark out on patrol. Next, a silvertip shark appears in the lights. Although this is usually an open water species, it does occasionally visit outer reefs in search of food. Disturbed by the lights, it quickly moves away. By the time their air supply comes to an end, they ascend without the memorable night encounter they were looking for. The morning dawns into a calm, warm day an ideal time for fishing. While Mark and Rob take a well-deserved rest, their friends search the open blue for the catch of the day. Lunch is caught quickly, but the panicking fish sends out distress signals, easily detected by one of the largest species of sharks, the great hammerhead. Reaches a maximum length of six meters, with an odd-shaped head filled with super keen sensors the only species of hammerhead that would attack a diver. Its super sensors guide the shark directly towards the dying fish. Aggressively, it harasses the spear fisherman. At this point, most men would keep out of such a dangerous situation. But this kind of opportunity is ideal for Mark and Rob's quest to free dive with an awesome shark and film it as close as possible. This is the largest of the hammerhead species and the only one that lives a solitary life, patrolling the open oceans for a meal. You do have to be very careful while filming sharks because they are large predators, but we're not their natural food. Generally they are after fish that we have with us or they're curious. By the time they start to film, the hammerhead has already eaten the speared fish. The shark calms into a determined patrol allowing the two men to get some shots of its extraordinary body. The hammerhead is my favourite shark species because of its large dorsal fin and strange looks. A second hammerhead approaches, probably also attracted by the commotion caused by the speared fish. This one has an entourage of pilot fish. They use the shark as a swimming larder, feeding on fish crumbs, parasites and even the shark's excrement. This one kept circling me. I'm sure it was attracted by the electrical field given off by my camera. In their noses, sharks possess gel-filled pores which give them a sixth sense. The incredible ability to detect the electric field emitted by living creatures, allowing the shark to find hidden prey. But metal also gives off its own electric current. And once the shark gets close enough to rob, his camera's field fools the hammerhead into thinking it could be a prey item. It's not surprising that it follows the divers and their cameras to the surface. To distinguish the source of electricity, the hammerhead needs to get closer. Eventually, it lunges at the camera. And satisfied that the strange object is not edible, it swims away, leaving behind two shaken yet ecstatic men. Once more, they manage to capture some close-up footage of one of the most impressive sharks on Earth. 
Mark and Rob hardly have time to regroup when an even more dangerous shark approaches, an oceanic white tip. Almost four meters long, lives alone in the open ocean far from land, notoriously dangerous and aggressive. Because of the shark's vicious reputation, the spear fishermen get back into the water to watch the cameramen's backs. We have encountered oceanic white tips in the Coral Sea before, and that's one species you don't want to mess with. A smaller specimen in comparison to the great whites, hammerheads and tiger that the guys died with before, but just as terrifying to meet face to face. With the habit of living mostly in the open ocean, this shark needs to be an opportunistic hunter, eating anything that comes its way. A diver could easily be mistaken for floating prey in the blue zone. It's a great experience to face something as big and at times lethal. Puts you on the edge, gets your adrenaline going. It's not for everyone, but I certainly enjoy it. Coming face to face with something that's probably feared by 99% of people on Earth. And this is exactly the kind of encounter that Mark and Rob look for. A face-to-face -face meeting with a dangerous shark hardly ever seen by man. And some magnificent footage to show for it. Up to now, the Coral Sea yielded their best Australian shark experiences. Together with their South African Great White Dive, Mark and Rob have free-dived with the Earth's most notoriously dangerous sharks. And they've emerged with some of the most unusual visuals ever recorded. But the two guys are not ready to stop now. They are running out of places to visit where they could meet up with sharks. Then, they receive some exciting information. A rare once-in-a-decade phenomenon is unfolding at Turtle Bay. In less than a day, they travel across Australia to the west coast and to a bay famous for its nesting turtles, friendly dolphins and, of course, sharks. The only way to Turtle Bay is by boat. Mark and Rob prepare their gear during the trip so that they can be ready as soon as they arrive in the bay. What they're about to film could last a few minutes or several weeks. No one really knows. Mark and Rob knew that they were going to see a large school of Australian anchovies being attacked by a few predators. But they did not expect to see anything as huge as the phenomenon that met their eyes. Stretching from cliff to cliff of Turtle Bay, an enormous school of tiny anchovies swimming so close to each other that they turn the sea black. They have never dived among so much bait before. Their excitement mounts as they prepare for the dive. Underwater, they get their first impression of the most awesome of sights. A moving, living mass, made up of an endless stream of tiny fish, a sinuous silver curtain billowing in the gentle current. The amassment of tiny fish is known as a bait ball. And this is the biggest bait ball that Mark and Rob have ever seen. Millions of anchovies swimming as one. Rob plunges into the mass. Like a living organism, the huge shoal swallows him, creating a tunnel just large enough for him to swim through. In some places, the shoal measures 15 meters from top to bottom. Mark squeezes in from underneath. Thousands of tiny fish swimming so close together that they block out the rays of the sun. It was such an eerie feeling to be surrounded by this massive cloud of fish packed so tightly together. The reason for such a large gathering of bait fish is probably sparked by the plankton blooms and coral spawning that occur during the colder months of May and June. Although the anchovies come here most years to feed on the plankton, they usually form small, isolated shoals. The last time they were seen in such an enormous bait ball was ten years before. Before this bait around, I was hoping that large predators would come in to feed. The first ones they see are the pelagic fish, like the mulloway. Then the larger, one metre long, broad barred mackerels rush in. With a sudden lunge, they forge lightning attacks to pick out one fish at a time.
The assaults make no visible difference to the millions upon millions of anchovies. Suddenly, a shark dashes out of the mass of tiny fish. Then more dart in and out. Spinner sharks. Streamlined three meter long predators who prefer to travel and hunt in schools, known to have harassed free divers. They are fast coastal water swimmers, always on the lookout for their favorite bait, small shoaling fish such as these anchovies. Although spinners have been known to attack humans, for now they seem to ignore Mark and Rob, focusing instead on the overabundance of prey. Side by side, hunters and spectators move through the writhing mass, each team on a separate mission, the sharks to eat as much as they can and the men to film it all. For the spinners, this is a grand feast. And for the two divers, this is a different kind of feast, a chance of a lifetime. Because a gathering of bait fish of such magnitude and all the predators that attack them is an incredibly rare sight. After all that feeding, by the end of the day, the bait ball seems to remain the same size. Exhausted, Mark and Rob return to the boat a little overwhelmed by the day's exciting events. Unbelievable. They decide to stay close to the action and spend the night on the boat moored in a protected enclave of Turtle Bay. Overnight, the sea conditions worsen. A northeasterly breeze brings a choppy surf. This does not intimidate the two divers in the least. Underwater, to Mark and Rob, the bait ball seems as enormous as it was the day before, and the spinner sharks eat as relentlessly as ever. But the visibility is considerably worse, as the choppy seas churn the ocean floor and sand and silt float in the water. The two men cannot see the approaching sharks, and at the same time the sharks cannot see them until they are too close to change course. This could become the most dangerous situation yet, being in the middle of a feeding frenzy in bad visibility. To avoid the possibility of getting bitten by a shark, the two guys decide to give up filming. The reason for the change in conditions soon becomes apparent. The northeaster brings a menacing weather front. The boat needs to be taken into the protection of the harbour. Mark and Rob are forced to return home. Regretfully, they leave the site after only a few memorable dives. They may never see so many sharks again. But they cannot keep away. Ten days later, they return to Turtle Bay, hoping that there may still be some action. To their astonishment, the huge bait ball of anchovies seems to be of the same size as when they last filmed here. Once underwater, they realize that the action has intensified and that there are more sharks in this one small area than Mark or Rob have ever seen. To them, it seems like every spinner in the ocean is here to feed on the bait ball. The sharks use all their six senses to track down areas teeming with fish where varying temperatures cause plankton blooms. What is evolving in front of Mark and Rob is a basic food chain, only of enormous proportions. I think the incredible part about this was that it took us out of our perceived normal routine of a person and put us into the food chain of nature. That we were an actual predator accepted by all these so-called feared sharks. It was just amazing. The sharks quicken their turns. They speed through the bait ball prompting each other into a feeding frenzy. This is when good visibility becomes so much more important for both the two men and the sharks. Mark and Rob can see a predator approaching and the sharks can distinguish anchovy prey and avoid a large human. Just when the guys think they've filmed it all, 
A surprise cruises out of the mass of anchovies. A brida's whale joins the feast. Systematically, the whale makes a few close passes to herd the anchovies closer together. At an average length of 13 meters, this is one of the smaller whale species and is often seen close to shore even in water as shallow as 3 meters. The acrobatic sequence ends with a final lunge to scoop up a huge mouthful of anchovies. Methodically, it comes back for more. For most of the year, it feeds in the open ocean on similar schools of baitfish and even larger shoaling fish such as tunas, mackerels and bonitos. Unperturbed by the presence of the divers, the whale swims past only a few metres away. Unbelievable! You see it? The whale just goes straight over. Yeah, I was looking one way to turn around and come across and through. It was unbelievable! This is a rare natural phenomenon hardly ever witnessed by man. An amassment of anchovies so huge that it keeps an army of predators feeding for several weeks, never harassing each other, but all intent on getting as many mouthfuls of baitfish as possible. What more could possibly happen to make Mark and Rob's experience any better than it already is? Day after day, the feeding feast continues. As long as the weather holds, Mark and Rob return to the water, never tiring or getting bored of this rare exhibition. The giants of the sea seem to gather in Turtle Bay. But the mantas are not here to feed on the baitfish. They have been attracted to this area for the same reason as the anchovies, to feed on the abundant plankton blooming during this time of year. With a wingspan of over six meters, this is an enormous fish, and yet it feeds on the tiniest of sea creatures. Mantas and whales, majesties of the ocean. Whales and sharks, hunters in their own right. Each predator ignoring the other, every one focused on catching its own prey. And then, even more sharks join the ranks. Hundreds of spinners herd the anchovies into the shallows. Now no baitfish can escape the shark patrol. The little fish are squeezed between the cliffs on the one side, the five meter deep reef underneath, and the relentless hunters blocking the only way out. The massive bait ball broadens and pushes against the surface. Now even the birds can take their pick. The gulls eat on the fly, while the heavier cormorant prefers to dive for his food. I felt so small being amongst all these predators, ignoring me, coming back for more to eat, over and over. They never seem to get tired. Free diving in the midst of hundreds of feeding sharks. Not every man's idea of fun, but Mark and Rob's most exhilarating adventure. The West Australian bait ball experience was the pinnacle of my diving career. For a week-long period, we were diving every day with all the predators, the sharks, the game fish, the whales, the manta rays. It was an awesome experience. I think this would be the absolute highlight of anything I've ever seen or done. To be accepted by nature as one, it was a very humbling experience and one that everyone should have. Ordinary guys with an incredible passion for sharks and a burning ambition to film their amazing behavior so close that anyone who watches can feel the thrill of diving with these animals. 
In pursuing this quest, they filmed rare and unusual sequences and developed an even greater admiration for the sharks that most people fear. Every time I got in the water with a different shark species, I found the experience as exhilarating as the one before. They need to be respected as formidable hunters, but certainly don't deserve their bad reputation. We've swum closer than an arm's length from a great white, and we could have touched most of the other sharks that came up to us. They are such awesome creatures that we just have to meet up with them again and again. This is certainly not the end of our shark quest.